Welcome to You've Got This with Sarah Hamaker, a podcast to encourage and equip moms along their parenting journey. Join Sarah each week as she interviews dads and moms like you and discusses the joys, challenges, and rewards of raising kids. Thank you for joining me today on You've Got This. My guest today is Dara Lovitz. She is a mom of six-year-old twin daughters. She also works in the legal nonprofit world, runs a nonprofit vegan advocacy group, can't talk today, and loves to read and write, which I am already a fan. I think we're going to be best friends now. Because that's my favorite pastime, too. She's also written a book, uh, Twin Sight, A Guide to Ri- Raising Emotionally Healthy Twins, and Catching Falling Cradles, A Gentle Approach to Classic Rhymes. Uh, welcome, Dara. I'm so glad that you could join me today. Thanks for having me. I'm so happy to be here. Now, um, twins. Some people hear that and they think, oh, my goodness, I would just die if I had twins. Did you feel that way when you learned you were having twins? No, I, I was thrilled. I was really excited. There aren't uh, twins in my immediate family, and it seemed really special. And I had plenty of fears about being pregnant and going into labor. And I thought, if I could get two out of you know two <laughs> out of one in this deal, it's like that that works out in my favor. So um, I was excited. I mean, of course, I had the same hesitations and fears that a lot of twin parents have, which has to do with immediately it has to do with costs of, mm-hmm. of two babies at once and then and then two toddlers at once and two preschoolers at once. Um, and then, you know, way down the line, two college students at once. Right. Um, but and also, how do you juggle? I mean, literally and and not literally juggle uh, two babies and um, the care of it. So I, I had the, the normal hesitations and and fears, but ultimately it was a feeling of joy and excitement, um, you know, and, and the usual nerves that go along with any pregnancy. Right. And I, um, I mean, I, I don't have twins. (laughs) I have four, four regular children. Um, I guess you could say they're not too regular. Um, (laughs) but, uh, and I, um, and I think when, I think when I've had conversations with, you know, with mothers and when they're either pregnant or just had kids, it's always, I don't think, um, I mean, it's, we always have these fears, right? We have these concerns about whether we have in twins, whether we're having one child, whether we have other children at home and we're pregnant again. Uh, you know, we all kind of have to kind of navigate through that, um, those kind of fears. So how do you, how did you kind of work through the, some of the concerns that you might have had? Um, I, I'm not sure my advice would be universal in the sense that I, I, my temperature runs anxious at, at, at any normal, my, my homeostasis, my, my normal Dara is anxious, worried, fearful. It's just how I am. I've always been this way. So, um, I don't know what a normal person's level of fear would be, but I ended up doing a ton of research. I Googled every issue. I ended up finding a couple of parenting blogs that I just, I liked the philosophy of, Mm -hmm. um, and I, I stuck with those as, I mean, some of them are replete with advice for every stage, every age, every stage of, of development for a child. And those are the ones I tended to do real searches on. Um, some I subscribed to, some I just visited. A lot of people gave me books which were, were helpful when they were going in the right direction. You know, so many books contradict each other. There's the books advocating for cry it out methods, for instance, and then the books advocating for attachment parenting and, um, because of the conflicting advice of books, I found the recommendation of books a little, I, I don't know, it was hard to take because some of them I agreed with and some I didn't. And um, I had to be a little more discriminatory when it came to books. But um, yeah, I, I think blogs and, and also if there's a parent in my life, um, not necessarily my parents, but some appear in my life who seems to be a good parent and I like what's happening in her, in her household, um, I tend to ask those people for advice too. Right. And I think that's important. Um, you know, many of the parents that uh, come to me for parent coach help, they've read all the books, right? Mm-hmm. They've, they've, um, and it's just hard sometimes to put that book knowledge into practice in your home. And what I've tried to do, um, at least with my, my own, my own small sliver of the parenting um, internet sphere is to remind us that we can do this. Parenting can be difficult at times, but we know our kids. 
-hmm. And we really have the best knowledge on how to do this. Um, it's really common sense. And we just get all tangled up, I think, and when we overread or, or we oversubscribe and we, we, think, we think that we have to do everything perfect. And I think one of the blessings of twins or having more than one child is realizing how different they all are and how one thing work for one is not going to work for the other, whether they're twins. Like I said, I know with my four children, I have two girls and then two boys. They're all different. And things that work for one of my daughters did not work for the other daughter. <laughs> the other daughter it was almost like you had to learn their language. Did you find that to be true as well? A hundred percent. And as a mom of twins who constantly advocates that the two individuals who are my children are completely separate, they happen to share a womb, but that's where their commonalities end. Mm -hmm. uh, otherwise, they're two completely distinct individuals. And as far as parenting advice for children is concerned, you hit the nail on the head. Each child is unique and what works for one child might not work for another. Um, there are some generalities in raising children. I mean, all children, no matter who they are, need love. Um, they need to feel safe and secure in their homes, uh, in their bodies, and you know they need to have bodily bodily autonomy. I mean, there are certain things that are general across the board for all children, and then there's a whole lot of variability depending on the the makeup and the wiring of the child. And and you have four children, and they're all unique and different. I, I assume they share the same genes, and maybe they share mm -hmm. most same genes, and and yet here they are different. And our daughters who were born. I witnessed them both <laughs> leave my body on the same day, um, and and they definitely shared the genes of, m of myself and my husband. Um, you know, a different combination for each, and yet, and I'm raising them in the same exact environment. You know, same household, same socioeconomic status. I mean, talk about some kind of study here, and and they've just sort of developed into these different individuals. Um, through no fault or credit of my own, it's just this is who they are. There's so much, if nothing else, a if I've learned nothing else from from studying twins and interviewing them, it's that nature versus nurture, nature wins. There's so much that's sort of beyond our control. Um, not to say that parents have no role. I mean, obviously, there's an important role we play in guidance and development and um, making sure they're safe. But as far as their personalities and, and whom they turn into, it's kind of it seems like the die has been cast there. No, I, yeah, I would agree. And I think that can be one of the, perhaps one of the dangers more with twins than with um, just multiple children in a family is the um, resisting the urge to categorize them as the same. I, uh, my kids are, um, even though they're roughly two years apart, they're, a, they're uh, my two girls are a year apart in school and so are my two boys, just the way birthdays Wow. fell on our calendar. And so I remember having the conversation when we had repeat teachers, you know, like my um, three of my kids had the same first grade teacher <laughs> and, you know, two of my girls had each had the same third grade teacher back to back and going in and reminding them, I know you kind of think, you know, daughter number two, right? but yeah. let me tell you, she's really different than her sister and just keep these couple of things in mind. Um, just because I know the tendency as humans, is to put people in a box. So when you see twins, I bet it's so easy to go, oh, they're twins, so they must be like, must be exactly alike, and okay, I don't have to think about it anymore. Um, and I think sometimes we do that as parents. We think, oh, well, you're going to be just like your sister, or you're just like your brother. Um, and it, I, I think that's a hard thing for us to fight against as parents, because getting to know your child as just your as that particular person and not as a twin or a sibling in a family, it takes work. It does. And I, I think I read somewhere that it's our it's our nature, it's our it's it's evolutionary <laughs> to group things. Um, you know, if we were back in the day when we were being chased by a woolly mammoth, it made sense to then say one woolly mammoth chased me, therefore all woolly mammoths are dangerous to me. You know, so we lump things into categories because it's convenient and because it's part of our nature and our instinct and our history um, as human beings. So it's natural. And like you said, it's kind of a crutch. It's kind of easy for parents to do that. It's easy for teachers to do that. It takes less work to assume that, that the children in one family are going to be similar to each other, if not the same. Um, and I urge parents to... If, for instance, my kids were, when they were in preschool, there was one year that they were in the same class because they didn't have um, two classes available for that age range. And 
when I, I would schedule the meetings for the two kids at separate times because the teachers would want to schedule me as uh, me and my husband at, in one meeting for both kids. And I refused because I, <laughs> I wanted to uh, emphasize that my children were two unique individuals. And, and at first I wanted to talk about daughter number one and not talk about daughter number two. And then for the next time slot, I wanted to talk about daughter number two. Um, but yes, and I've, and and this is another reason I'm not going to get into the school separation issue unless you ask me to. But one of the issues with having your your twins in the same class is that teachers will just sort of either they'll you know at at worst they'll compare them and make them pit them against each other and make them competitive with one another. But you know even in the in the lightest in in not a big uh, issue here that they have they will just sort of lump them in and. Um, Assume that they're the same. We, I even had a parent complain to me once that her children, her identical children, were in the same Spanish class, and the Spanish teacher clearly gave the wrong student the wrong grade. You know, she switched them up, she confused them, and she gave the wrong student the wrong grade. And the parent was furious and thought, gosh, this is your job as a teacher to grade this oral presentation, and you you confused my children for one another. Um, so it's, it's very easy to do it, it and I think parents um, – should do a better job of, of trying to understand the uniqueness and the individualness of each child. Um, and that's why I advocate one-on-one time. I mean, I do it for all, for all parents. Anytime anybody asks me, you know, I'm having trouble and I just don't get, I mean, you, you know, I'm fighting with my son a lot right lately. And I say, just go on a date with your, with your child, just, the, you know, just you two and talk about anything and hang out and get to know him and get to know his likes and, um, it's hard, especially, I mean, someone like you, you have four kids. It's hard to find time for one-on-one time with each child. Um, but it's, you know, it's, it's pretty important if you want to make things go smoothly in a household and have each child feel, feel appreciated for who he or she is. Oh yeah. I'm a huge, huge advocate of one-on-one time. Um, we started years ago in our family, um, breakfast with mom or dad. <clears throat> if there was, there was actually a, <laughs> there's a sheet on our refrigerator right now that has um, every first and third Friday of the month, my husband and I take turns on a rotating basis to make it all. This is one thing where you need to be fair <laughs> with yeah. your kids. Um, you know, to go to breakfast. In fact, I'm going to breakfast with my youngest on Friday. They get to pick the place. Um, and then we in the other rule that we have, um, well, the main rule that we have is that we're not going to talk about other siblings. And we're not going to talk about the things that we want that child to improve upon. I mean, that's just kind of my husband and I talked about this. This is not how we want to spend the time. This time is just spent talking with them about what interests them. And let me tell you, I've had some really slightly boring breakfasts with like my preschool. <laughs> the kids were in preschool because, you know, they wanted to go to Chick-fil-A and I'd eat five bites with them and they're off wanted to play at the <laughs> in the playground. Right. But that was but they loved that. And just knowing that you have that time with them builds it so that when you're in the car with them, they actually want to talk to you sometimes. Uh, because you've made that effort um, to have that one-on-one time. So whether you have twins or just a couple of kids or even just one kid, you know, you need to have that. You think, how could you not have one-on-one time with one kid? But believe me, it can happen. You know, you don't want every interaction to be a barrage of questions from mom or dad. You know, you want it to have to make that connection because that's really what we're going for here, right? You want to make sure that you have that connection with your kid because it does make life go easier. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I think sometimes at the end of the day, I reflect on, on what took place and areas for improvement in some cases. And oftentimes I think about what are the words that I shared with, with my children. Um, and a lot of it is logistical or it's orders or it's, you know, put your shoes on, go to the bathroom, put your shoes on, go to the bathroom, put your shoes on, get your backpack. We have to go. We have to go. Yes, you can have a cookie. You have to eat something helpful. And it's, it's all, it's like this. Um, and, and then they, they say things to me and it's usually requests, requests for food, um, or something about school. And it's only until the end of the day when we're lying in bed and I, I sort of, I lie in bed and cuddle with, with them at night before they go to sleep. And that's finally when we can talk. And by we, I mean they. And all of a sudden, I'm hearing about what happened in school. Now, meanwhile, when I pick them up from school, I say, 
how was your day? And I asked specific questions. What, you know, what happened in this? And did you, did you talk about the pumpkin and whatever? And, um, nothing like they don't want to talk about it. And when I pick them up from school, they have no interest in describing what happened in school. It's only at nighttime when I expect them to go to sleep promptly that they all of a sudden they have a lot to say. Um, and it's fine because I, I tend to start bedtime earlier than I need to, because I know that I want to build in some time for them to talk and to, to think that they're staying up late talking to me when really we're really on time. <laughs> but, um, but they have a lot to say at nighttime. You know, that if the lights are out, there's no distraction, no TV, no food, nothing to distract us. And now I hear everything about their day, the good things, the bad things. Um, and it's a chance for me to really get to know them. And, and if I didn't have that time at night, if I had a work meeting or I was teaching at night, um, I would feel at a loss. Like I, I would feel distant from my children. So I'm, I'm glad we have that time. But um, I think a lot of parents, too, if they think about the words they exchange with their children regularly, it's usually just like logistical stuff. And it's not deep. It's not emotional. It's not um, it's not going to help them get to know their kid better. So I think it's great that you do that, that you schedule these breakfasts with your with your children. Um, my neighbor who has four children, she on their birthdays every year, she takes a day off from work. She takes the child out of school and they do whatever the child wants for the whole day. They go to the arcade, the museum, the playground, whatever, um, the favorite restaurant. And it's just like a special day. And that's in honor of their birthday. And that's their birthday present. And it's um, and she does it for each of her four children. And she said otherwise she just she wouldn't be able to connect with them. She doesn't have time on a daily basis to connect with each of the four children every single day. You know, it's just not feasible. But she makes sure that each child knows that they're that they're loved and valued and on birth, their birthday. Like, What better way to celebrate one's one's day of birth is to really have this special time with the parent. And I know a lot of the um, the twins I interviewed, they also said things like they appreciated that one night the mom would take them uh, after dinner. One night the mom would take one twin out for a walk. And then the next night she'd take the other twin out for a walk just around the neighborhood after dinner so they could talk and um, relax. And I, I, th- I like that idea too. I mean, I live in the Northeast part of the country. So right now I don't feel like going outside to take a walk, but I could see that on a nice summer night to just walk around the block when my kids are a little older and, capable of walking around the block with me. Um, I think that would be a really nice time. And again, for some reason, with the darkness, it's like everything is tuned out and you can really listen to the other person and, and focus on what the other is saying. And there's just less distraction at nighttime. Yeah, and I think that captures what we miss as parents, that it's not the big gestures that matter the most. Mm-hmm. Right. You're little I mean, you're I love, you know, your story of how you connect with um, with your twins at night, um, you know, and that takes what, 10, 15 minutes of time. If the, you could even do five minutes would even be, you know, uh, an, enough time to have a connection with our kids. We often think we have to set aside huge amounts of time or do, you know, have something super structured or exciting and fun for them to feel that connection with us. And the reality, we don't. You know, even the mom you said who does the birthday thing, which I think is an an awesome idea as well. I mean, she could connect with her kids in like two minutes a day and make them feel special. Uh, You know, for example, um, one parent, um, one of my clients, she was having trouble with her connecting with her eight-year-old boy. And I said, well, what is he really like? She goes, well, he's really into jokes. I said, okay, here's what you do. I want you to go on the Internet, look up a joke book for boys, and and just memorize a couple of jokes, and then just tell him two jokes a day at random. Mm -hmm. And she was like, I said, try that. And then we we talk, you know, usually I talk to my clients like once a week, and I talk to her the next time. She goes, you would not believe the first time I told him the joke he looks at me, his little eyes light up, and he was like, Mom, where'd you get that? That was great. You know, and then he shares a joke with her. And so they started this positive connection, even though there was a lot of behavior issues to work through. I was like, you know, if we, this, the little gestures, those little jokes really made a difference. You know, like I point out bird articles to one of my boys who loves birds. Every time I see one in the newspaper, I call him over. I'm like, hey, look at this. And his little eyes light up and he's like, oh, because we're paying attention to him, right? We know them. The one-on-one time is great when it's a little more formal because, let's face it, we're all busy. And (laughs) if we didn't have some of these things on the calendar, they would slide. 
Mm -hmm. But it's also those little gestures. And we have to remember, kids remember the little silly stuff a lot more. That's more meaningful to them a lot of times than these huge gestures. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And those little ones add up. It's about, you know, even in, in kindergarten, my kids are learning about their cup and filling their cup with good things. And um, when something sad happens, their cup gets a little emptier. And, you know, and, and this is something that you think about when you're they were teaching it sort of in a social, um, like how to get along socially with one another. So if you say something mean to someone that depletes their cup a little bit. But if you say something nice, you're putting something into their cup. So they have this visual and, um, you know, what can you do to fill this person's cup? This person's feeling sad. What can you do to fill her cup? And I love that idea. But with a child, those little things, like you said, it adds up. So you're, you're constantly filling the cup with little things, little bits of interaction that are positive and personalized and um, makes the child feel special. And it, it fills their cup a little bit so that if they're having a bad day, which kind of takes away from their cup, you can you can add to it. You can add to their cup and fill it up and. Um, I think it goes a long way, those those little interactions, like you said. It, it does. And it also it also makes the times when you have to correct them because of a misbehavior or a chore that they didn't do. It also makes it makes them more receptive to hearing that connection when they feel closer to you they're more apt to not get all out of sorts um, as quickly um, when you when you ask them to do something or remind them or have to correct them um, because let's you know a lot of our job as parents is you know training them and in training sometimes you have to go and say no that's wrong mm-hmm. <laughs> we need to fix it um, but when you like I love the cup I've heard the cup or the bucket example <clears throat> you know visual as well it's really great for kids to think like that to think about filling something up as opposed to um, you know, just pouring something out, I guess <laughs> they kind of get that because they're always pouring in, things in and out of cups and <laughs> sand and especially that kind of thing when they're playing as kids. So I love that. Um, we were about the end of our time today, and I am so glad that you joined me. Um, you've been listening to You've Got This. With, I'm your host, Sarah Hamaker, and today I have Dara Lovitz with me. She's a mom with six-year-old twin daughters, and her most recent book, I highly recommend it, is Twin Sight, A Guide to Raising Emotionally Healthy Twins. Thank you, and I hope I will join you next week. Bye. Thanks for listening to this week's podcast of You've Got This with Sarah Hamaker. Sign up to receive notification of new podcasts and listen to previous editions at sarahhamaker.com. Until next time, remember, parenting might be hard sometimes, but don't worry, you've got this.